Yo, what's going on, everyone? We are now live with Mr. Bradley Holman. What's going on, hello, Brad? Hello, world. Oh, I'm doing good, doing good. So um, for those of you guys that don't know, I uh, got the opportunity to work with Brad in 2019. Yeah. I always say last year, right? And last year, I guess, is now two years ago. Yeah. Which is crazy. So It does seem like last year. It really does. Yeah. But we're going to be talking big spinnerbaits. We're just going to be hanging out, talking. and. Um, this really all goes back to that Grand Lake tournament a couple of years ago. Like when I was trying to come up with ideas of things to talk about, um, you were obviously one of the guys that popped into my brain because we were just mm -hmm. on the phone the other week. But especially that Grand Lake tournament, it stuck with me how comfortable you looked fishing that big spinnerbait. And right. so it was one of those things that I think um, a lot of people can learn from. And it's a cool technique that I know is a little bit seasonal specific or time of year specific. And mm. uh, Yeah. And then we're just going to chat. So Everyone over in the comment section, um, drop some love on Bradley Holman's stuff. He's been posting some awesome content um, on the water, fishing content, uh, content that'll get you guys some more information on how to be better anglers as well. So go over and check out his channel. He's absolutely killing it right now. But give us a little introduction of who you are, Brad, for the people that may not know you. Um, yeah. I am a... I'm an Okie from Muskogee. I'm not actually from Muskogee. I'm from Norman, Oklahoma, but uh, I'm an Okie. Um, I'm 46 years old. I've basically, I fished at some level pretty much my whole life. I never did start fishing tournaments until I was probably 19 or 20. So I guess in that aspect, I was kind of a late bloomer. But um, I fished tournaments for a long time. I spent six years on the Elite Series, and I spent four or five years on the FLW Tour. So I've spent over a decade on the National Tours, and now I'm back at, um, Bassmaster trying to get back into the Elite Series because I left FLW with the uh, with the purchase by MLF. Just you know, uh, format styles not really. I was never not really my style. I kind of like five fish, so I've gone the other direction, and now I'm yeah. kind of stuck in a bass fishing purgatory a little bit. You know, with the opens with 225 guys and trying to fight for three or four spots. But uh, I'm cool with that. It's what I've done my whole life. So. Uh, that's pretty much what I am. I'm basically an open angler, I guess, at this point. So talk a little bit about that, right? Because it has to be a big change, but also like the first time you qualified to now, mm -hmm. like how have you noticed things changing? How have you noticed yourself change? Maybe as a fisherman, like what got you in the first time? And, you know. Well, you know, I, uh, I've probably qualified two or three times, actually. Um, I fished the opens back when I was on the elite series and I continued to fish the opens and I know I qualified a couple of years that way as well but anyway the, the the difference the main difference is 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 the amount of competition that's out there it's not it's uh, the level of competition is obviously greater now than it was then i mean at any point it's the further we get along this thing with technology and things and anglers have all gotten better but uh man the, the sheer numbers there was at 225 boats in the central opens um the central opens used to be you know, a tournament in Texas, a tournament in Oklahoma, maybe one in Arkansas or one in Missouri. Whereas now, you know, with Bass's mapping of the United States, Central somehow ends up in Alabama and other places. But um, so it's it's more national, really, I guess is the way you would say it. And yeah. it is um, the numbers, man, 225 guys trying to get three spots. I think the year that I qualified that I actually took it was 2006 was my rookie year on the Elite Series. So 2005. Man, I mean, there was probably 150 guys in the opens, but um, they probably – I don't even know where I finished in the points, but um, it wasn't in the top five in the points, you know, and they, they worked down. So, you know, there wasn't – everybody wasn't just dying to get in, right? There wasn't that many guys just dying to go pay $55,000 in entry fees, whereas, you know, in 2020, it's like, hell, everybody's got $55,000 to go throw it. Yeah, fee. it seems that way at least, right? Yeah, yeah, everybody's got it, so – um, I don't know what's changed there, but something definitely has, and uh, that's kind of where it is. But that, that that's the biggest difference is just the sheer numbers, and and they take less. Back then, they were taking five. Yeah. Um, you know, they took 15 each year. So um, now they've got it down to 12, and uh, we're lucky to have that because, really, I think they wanted it at nine. But yeah. they, they've thrown in that that AOY for the, for the overall group. So well, the guys yeah. that fish all of them. And it's kind of cool too. I mean, what you've done, right? Because you have an established career. I mean, you've been in this a long time. You have mm -hmm. some trophies behind you, and you've, you've had some big wins. But yep. at the same time, 
we get to see the process of a guy who's made it kind of try to get back in to the, yeah. to the elite. So, I mean, we've talked personally off offline, but I think that's really cool. Yeah. It's been a little bit, you know, hard, but it's been a little bit of challenge, but I mean, I don't mind it. It really just turned out to be, I wasn't one of the lucky ones for whatever reason. Right. Cause I mean, like there's guys at MLF that don't have, you know, those trophies that are behind me. And there's guys at Bass that sure don't have trophies like that behind me on the elite series. But um, I just didn't get picked, you know, whenever, for whatever reason, whenever they went through their picking process, of course, with the MLF deal, I was at FLW at the time. So um, the uh, FLW guys that got picked to go back to Bass to replace them, you know, they went through their list and, you know, I'm not a politician. I didn't pick up the phone and call or email anybody and say, Hey, I'm interested, but uh, looking back, maybe I should have, but. You know, yeah. it's it's been a good journey. It's a good story. Um, it suits me. It's kind of who I am. I'm kind of a put my head down and grind anyway and not say a whole lot. So um, when I make it, it'll be just, you know, that much better. And it's kind of like, man, you, a lot of people don't know this, maybe not know this. You're sort of like a journeyman, right? Like when I first pulled up to meet you guys, you don't have stickers all over your boat. You don't have logos everywhere you're not sponsored by this that and every single company right right just kind of do your thing keep your head down and go fishing and it's just mm-hmm. kind of who you are man so i mean i'm excited for you i mean i think a lot of the people that are watching the stream are excited for you so hopefully you know hopefully I'm, it'll re- happen soon dude i've been i've been really fortunate to to last this long in this career you know to be able to be out here this long and um, I just love doing it, dude. That's really what it boils down to. I mean, you know, you, at some point you got to make some decisions in life. And I went through that. You and I have talked about, you know, me and my personal decisions and kind of how I ended back up on the FLW tour. And, uh-huh. um, you know, it, 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 it basically just becomes a decision in life. You're like, Hey, I'm 40 something years old. And like, you don't have a whole lot of time left. I mean, wh- what do you really want to do? And I mean, the biggest thing that has always scared me is, is I don't want to be 65 and go, well, I wish I would have tried this. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah, I wish I would have tried that. So I just, that's kind of why I am where I am. No, that's awesome, man. And kind of going back to the topic we're going to talk about, the spinnerbait stuff, talk a little bit about um, the BFE, the the best flipper ever from Big Bite. You had a yep. huge hand in that. I know a lot of guys have had you on their podcast talking about flipping and the bait. and um, A little bit about your, I guess, um, your plan to get back into the elites. But talk about the BFE a little bit, and then we'll get into the spinnerbait topic. So Big Bite was a company that, that I started working with a couple of years ago. And um, after I'd been with them for about a year, they came to me with an idea about designing a bait. And um, Valster actually had multiple ideas on this, of the way this was going to work. He was like, look, you know, I, I do want you to design a bait. I know you don't know that much about it. I've got some people that will help you, you know, as far as bait design. Um, I want you to record it. He said, I want you to document it all. I want you to have Panger help you with it. And you and Panger just kind of bounce off each other and come up with this bait design. And I want you guys to document the whole thing. And so we did. You know, that's exactly what we did. And um, Panger and I took off to the tackle store and we worked on some stuff. And I I came up with an idea of, you know, I definitely wanted to make a flipping bait if I was going to get to make a bait. And, um, you know, we just had a lot of thought and energy from all the years that I've been fishing, you know, with bait designs and different things. And I kind of knew exactly what I wanted ballpark wise. So between Panger and I, you know, we throw some stuff together and then I've got this piece of plastic. That's like 15 different baits. You know, you've cut all these different pieces and kind of glued them together. Now, what do you do with it? Do I put this in an envelope and mail it to big body? <laughs> you know, yeah. What do I do? Yeah. So uh, we sit down at the living room and I got to thinking about my daughter, my 16 year old, and she can draw, man. Like I can't draw a stick, man. But she can, she can draw. She is a, hell of an artist but um i asked her i said hey you think you could do this for me and so she just sits down and starts freehand and i'm like that's it that's it <laughs> and so i'm like let's change this and this and she's like okay and she just erased it she changed and i'm like you think you could do this on graph paper like to scale and she's like well yeah so and she just knocked it out of the park and um it worked and i took those drawings and the bfe was born yeah that's that was her. so cool like hearing that part of the story, I mean, I've watched a little bit of the video, but I've, I've honestly have not looked into it to that extent, but knowing that your daughter made that, like that's going to last forever. Like the BFA is going to be around for however long, but like, yeah, 
that it, she helped you make that bait. Dude, she rocks that video too. She's I should, probably should have put it at the beginning. So back then, I mean, I thought that I know what the hell I'm doing now, but <laughs> back then I didn't have a clue to even think to like do a little montage at the beginning yeah. and put like all the important things, you know, just little clips. But yeah, that should have been in the very beginning because her part of sitting down at the dining room table at our kitchen table and drawing that that night is it's it's what puts that video over the top. That's got to give you chills. I mean, I got chills. Dude, got she was 14 chills. years old when she did it. I mean, it was incredible. And uh, she did a she did an awesome job. So there was a question that just came in from Dirk White. He said, what would you have done for a living if you didn't make it as a pro? Like, when did you really decide that's what you wanted to do? Man, you know how we talk about how we know things when we're young? Like, I know I told you I didn't fish tournaments until I was 20, and that's true. Yeah. Um, I, I can remember being 12, 13 years old and coming home after church on Sundays and teeing in outdoors. And I'm older than you, Ben. You may not remember this, but teeing in outdoors was the TV channel on, on cable back then yeah. that, uh, that we got Bassmaster on. And it would come on on Sundays, probably about one o'clock after church, because it seemed like it was always on. We'd come home for Sunday dinner. But um I was ate up with it and I loved it and I watched it and I'd be like, man, I want to do that. That's of course, I'm sure I'm just like everybody else. You know, they all think they want to do that, but man, that just kind of kept on. And, and, and when I was 18, I took a summer job with a group of guys that owned a plumbing company. And, um, I worked there 13 years, by the way, that summer job, but, um, they all That's fished. A long summer, dude. That's a long summer. Yeah, it was a long summer. They uh, they all bass fished and they ran tournaments. A little trail called Hog Haven. It's still going here in Oklahoma. And uh, they got me, they got me in. And you know, hey, go fish with so and so. Go fish with so and so. And then next thing you know, I'm, I was going ninety to nothing. But um, yeah, I, I knew at a young age that, that I loved it. Um, I obviously fished and stuff. I just didn't fish tournaments. My dad wasn't a tournament fisherman. We had a bass boat and everything, but we just fished for whatever bit. And, um, but yeah, we used to, me and a buddy of mine, we used to go out. My dad would actually drop us off the lake. This happened three to four days a week in the summer. So my dad worked at Oak Ridge. He was a civil engineer at the plant there the in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. And he would uh, drop Which us like off. like right by Alex, by the way. Alex yeah, like, yeah. Yeah. Alex is right there by Watts Bar, isn't he? Yeah, he's, Hill. he's in Knoxville. Well, yeah, just outside of Knoxville and Powell, and we fished Watts Bar by Oak Ridge. Like we went where they said don't go. If he comes on tonight, I'll go get my bass up that's upstairs off the yeah. wall. I've got one mounted. It's from Watts Bar. But um, yeah, my dad would drop us off, me and my my best friend, and we would do this like four days a week. He would drop us off on his way to work at like six thirty seven in the morning, and then he would just take the trailer on to work and just leave us. And then he would come back and pick us up at 4.30 or 5 on his way back home. So we could fish. And we had our choice. I mean, because up there at Oak Ridge, we could go to Melton Hill too. So, like, if we'd get tired of Watts Bar, we'd go to Melton Hill. The only thing really that he really had was is he would never give us much more than about five, six gallons of gas. So we couldn't go very far. Yeah. <laughs> he always kept us low on gas. Like, we could never have much gas. But, man, we ran around. We fished all day. And, and, and we would do that three or four days a week. And golly we would pretend that we were in tournament you know like he and i would have tournament against each other and then we'd pretend you know so we'd take off in the morning we thought we were in a tournament and just, <laughs> just stupid kid stuff you know i mean how why did it take so long to get into tournaments like why did it take you till 19 just didn't know anybody you know what i mean like um i just didn't have that influence of anybody around me to say hey this is a red man tournament and you just pay your money you can go fish you know if you show up here or show up there yeah i just didn't have that you know my my dad had a friend of his, John Peters, was another engineer at the plant who's still a good friend of mine. Um, he fished in tournaments, but just team stuff, you know. You know, I, I I don't know. There just never really was that push. But I came back to Oklahoma to go to school at the University of Oklahoma and, and took that summer job. And those guys, like I say, they all fished. And um, I just – you know, started fishing tournaments there. Hell, man, I mean, I bought my first bass boat. I wasn't – I might have been 19, maybe, yeah. you know. Uh, you know, my dad wasn't the type to uh, – neither one of my parents, they weren't the type to – I mean, pretty much when you're 18, you walk out the door and you were on your own. Now, you know, paying for school or books, something like that, they would do. But, like, you, your your car, your vehicle, your truck, your your housing, your apartment, whatever you lived in, you know, you was on your own on that deal, you know. Like, I could I yeah. could go to the bookstore – you know, start a semester of school and I could 
I could buy all my books and come home and I could take a receipt of the books and mail it to my dad, you know, and he would mail me a check for the same amount. To the exact <laughs> you know exactly. what I mean? Yeah. He's like yeah. not giving you that gas money. And yeah. I, he probably would let me go to college for like 12 years and paid for it. If I would wanted to probably, if I would just <laughs> sending him receipts along with a report card that said I was passing, he's probably good. Yeah. That's funny. So I got a picture and then we'll start to dive into the, the winter race stuff. I got a picture last year, two years ago now when we were at Grand Lake. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm going to pop it up. If you don't mind, I'm going to pop it up. And what it is, is this picture here, if you can see this. Do you see this picture? Mm -hmm. yeah. So can, can you give me some information on who this is? Like, is he your mentor? Yeah, that guy's pretty special to me. Um, dude, I about cried when I saw him that day on stage. He, <laughs> yeah. uh, his name is Steve Williams. So, you know, everybody's got to have one of these probably. Um, it's kind of hard to explain, but so like I told you, I was in Oklahoma right. and I was fishing these little hog Haven team tournaments. And then somewhere from there, you know, after hog Haven, those guys just kind of like my dad, they just kind of do what they do. And they fish their team tournaments around these little lakes in Southern Oklahoma. And I, I wanted more, you know, I wanted to do more. And by this point, you know, I'm working and making money. I've got a bass boat. And well, if that's what we want to call it, it was a boat. It, it would catch yeah. on fire from time to time, but it was, it was, it, it was a boat. And, um, I wanted to go fish, you know, stuff that I would see or hear about the B, you know, the red man's back then or the BFLs. And so I started traveling. I fished a little bit as a co-angler in the late nineties, probably. And then, um, and then I, and then I started fishing as a boater, but didn't have a clue what I was doing. And so I'm up there at Grand Lake and my wife, had an uncle that owned a jewelry store there in Grove, Grove, Oklahoma. And I'm going to tell y'all folks, Grove is, it's a metropolis. Um, there's probably 4,000 people in Grove, maybe five. I don't know. It's not very big. Yeah. Um, anyway, uh, people on here from Grove will be mad at me. It's probably a lot bigger than that, but we can't count the whole county, like what they're going to do. They're going to count every house around the lake and nobody's in it because it's their summer or lake house, but it's a small community. And um, he owned a jewelry store anyway in town, and he he had been there his whole life. And he was telling me about this guy that was his buddies with that won all these boats. You know, he'd won six or seven boats, and he'd lived here his whole life. And he was a great fisherman on Grand Lake. Well, that was Steve, and uh, he introduced me to Steve. And Steve was a little bit older, and just kind of you know wasn't tournament fishing as much as he had used to. And he was. He was a little standoffish at first because, I mean, he just didn't run me out there right off the bat. I I would stop by. He was working at a gas station and uh, out at Bryant's one stop. And he, he just ran the cash register. And uh, it's just a job. No, Steve would work it. And, and he would I would stop in there in the evenings and tell him about my fishing escapades on Grand Lake. And he would always ask me, he'd say, you don't you don't you don't catch any flipping them willis. And I'd say, no, I don't catch any flipping them willis. I tried. Did you try? A bunch of them? Yeah, I tried a bunch of them. Well, this went on for a while, and uh, finally one day it was 110 in Hades, and I'm out there by myself, and I hadn't caught anything, and I pull up there, and six inches of water, and the sun's beating down, and, and I'm like, well, he just keeps harping on these trees. I guess I'll throw something up there in there. I mean, it's six inches deep. Why would there be a fish under there? It's 110. Yeah. yeah. Well, I found out four pounder later. I was like, ooh. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I see what he might be talking about. And so I dinked around there and got a couple more bites and I ran, you know, that night I ran over to his gas station and I was like, you're going to be so proud of me. I got some bites. And he was like, really? And I was like, yeah. And he said, I'll never forget this. He said, you want to go in the morning? And I mean, I knew he worked till midnight, you know? And I was like, yeah. And he said, uh, he said, meet me at the ramp, five 30, bring your boat and I'll ride with you. And I was like, all right. That's he so was at the ramp five 30 in the morning and we have been, like this ever since. And I mean, that day with him was an eye opener, dude. I mean, it was offshore. <laughs> it was 20 something pound bags. And he's just like, this is, you know, <laughs> it was, this was before GPS. This was before you were out there in the middle of nowhere. And I'm like, what are we fishing? He's got some goofy name for everything, but yeah, he knew a lot. He had a, he had a really good friend named Larry Bryant that, that also took to me the same as he did. And Larry was, he was Daryl Robertson's team partner. Uh, back in the day there so i mean these guys are some of the legends at grand lake and they did a lot for me dude they did a lot for me 
from that point on, as I got better, I, I competed more like a local on Grand Lake, even though I lived three hours from it. Um, yeah, th those guys were special. He did a lot that, for me. That is so cool, man. I know I had to ask about that because, I mean, just interesting to me. I, I knew he was close to you or you're close to him. Mm -hmm. So um, that's really cool. Special what guy. Do you, what do you consider your home lake, right? Because I know Grand is sort of, but not. Yeah. You know, honestly, anything inside the Oklahoma border, I feel pretty comfortable with, um, especially the big ones. So, the, you know, when I say the big ones, the ones that the, the bigger tournaments show up on. So Lake Eufaula, uh, Lake Texoma, uh, Grand Lake, uh, Fort Gibson, Arkansas River. Um, I'm pretty comfortable in all of them. Arkansas River is probably where I'm not the strongest, although I have a couple of really good friends that will give me anything that they've got um, that are river rats, you know. Yeah. But – and I've had some good tournaments there, but it's not – when everything kind of falls out at the river, it seems like even in national events, I don't have much to scramble on. Um, it can all fall out of the bottom at Grand or Texoma, and a lot of times I've got two or three audibles. Even if I haven't tried them, I've got a pretty good chance that one or two of them might work, you know. So that tournament that you were at actually at Grand – um, two years ago, I had to call an audible on day two at about 11 or 12 o'clock. And I went to an area of the lake that I hadn't been to, hadn't seen in over 12 months, but I had a gut feeling with the weather that was coming in, the things that were going down and dude, the first place I stopped, I, I went all the way to the bottom end of the lake. And the first place I stopped, I couldn't even fish because there was two boats in there. Well, at the time I didn't know it, but it was it was that boy that had caught that giant bag that day. So I ran straight to where it was fixing to go down. And um, I just went one pocket over and caught him. But uh, I'm having a problem remembering that kid's name. But he, uh, he caught him really good that day, like 23 or 24 pounds. And he was sitting right on the stretch I was wanting. Because I tried to get in there. And yeah. uh, I fished. I went past him and I fished. And then I turned around, came back thinking he would go on and I could fish it. And when I came back, he turned his boat around, kind of did one of those blocking deals. And I never could get in there. And, um, but anyway, it was, uh, it was the right move that end of the lake fired. What was happening was, was it was a thunderstorm was coming in and what I had done the day before to catch them, the lake had dropped too much and the water had fallen out and I couldn't do it. And so I called that audible and man, it worked. Who did it work? They were on fire when I got down there. Yeah. Because the lake was high, right? The lake was really high when you guys went mm -hmm. there. And it was, it was high enough when practice started, it was just falling every day. And I kind of had a lake level that I can't really catch them past uh, in the bushes. And quite honestly, the first day of the tournament, um, lake level wise, by number, it was the lowest. It was the lowest by half a foot that I've ever caught them. And I caught them pretty good. Todd caught them even better. Todd caught 20 pounds out of that lake level. I couldn't believe it. Yeah. And what were you guys doing? on Day one, it was a big spinnerbait, right? Day, like day one, mm -hmm. you guys were doing a big spinnerbait in the dock slips and bringing uh -huh. it down. Or was mm -hmm. that in the was that in the it was willow tree, trees and bushes on the bank we had it all to ourselves nobody else there they didn't think there was I, enough water i remember seeing you pull up into a pocket like mm -hmm. i edited some of brad's footage or, or pulled some of the clips out but i remember seeing you pull up into this pocket and there's this giant giant willow in the water mm -hmm. right and yep. i guess that was day one i do think i did catch a big one off of uh, off the end of a dock on day one too as well now that you say that but it was primarily the willows the willows was the salvation that day and uh, the willows have been my salvation for many years granted and all of us are that way jason christie same way and um yeah. we have a we have a love affair with those things but um they can burn you too and um the the lake level just got too low or there just wasn't there wasn't enough water in them come day two and that's when i kind of had to call that audible and i tried but um then i just all i did was take the same bait and i turned around and put it on docks and did the same thing with it and, and that bait was a big spinner bait and that's kind of where we're going to transition into this thing so a couple of years ago they had the elites um bass master classic on grand you saw the big big, big spinner bait play for jason christie uh -huh. right and you just keep seeing spinner baits of some sort whether it's a big colorado or jeremy lawyer one of with like a double painted um, willow yeah. with big willows, but talk to me about spinnerbait fishing. Like we're going to try and do a full breakdown seminar on this. So we're going to basically start by talking about, um, typically when are you fishing a big spinnerbait? Then we'll go into where you're going to fish it. And then we'll talk about how and the baits that you like to use. Okay. So like when does a big spinnerbait really play for you? There's 
one of those guys, you know, like that guy in that picture you showed me, that was his favorite bait. And I learned a lot from that man about it. Um, th there's no time that you can ever put it down. I mean, it, it can work anywhere, everywhere. I mean, it even works up there where you guys live on smallmouth. I love, I've learned that being up there. Um, they like it a little faster, right? Where you guys yeah. are, but they, it attracts the right size. It still catches big ones. Yeah. Um, you know, primarily, primarily where it shines is I would say pre-spawn um pre-spawn to spawn depending on water color um the dirtier the water you have so the more particles per million of dirt um which we seem to have plenty of here in oklahoma yeah um, the spinnerbait will work right through the spawn what, what what happened here in oklahoma for many many years and, and guys just didn't realize it was man they're catching spawning fish and they just don't know it whenever those big giant 26 27 28 pound bags of largemouth are coming in on a spinnerbait dude those fish were on a nest you know they were on a bed you just can't see them because the water's so dirty but um can't convince a lot of those old timers of that but um that's that's definitely what was happening um so really pre-spawn to spawn is, is, is the best time when we're saying big spinner baits we're talking half three quarter ounce spinner baits but primarily we're talking big blades right yeah um blades more so than than actually the weight of the the spinner bait um, they just tend to be a little half or three quarter just because it takes a lot to get that big blade to cover the depth range that you're looking for right but um that's that's the primary time of year pre-spawn to spawn the pre-spawn the little bit early pre-spawns where a lot of guys aren't looking at it you know where they weren't prior to probably jason's Bassmaster classic you know jason kind of put that thing on the map because he was just crushing them right. um and a lot of guys weren't looking for that they all showed up with the rogues and the jig and they were going to do all this and that spinner bait really will play <clears throat> play in the pre-spawn you know it, it it it's the same fish that you catch with a rogue does that make sense? Right. It's, yes. It's a, it's a lot of the same fish. So like when you see around docks. Because that rogue's huge down there. So for the guys is. that don't know, I remember pulling into the parking lot or pulling into the place that you guys were staying and you guys were going back and forth about the rogue versus the spinnerbait. And I'm sure you mm -hmm. have both rigged up, but mm -hmm. talk a little bit about what you just said. I mean, it's, so the, same it, it's the same fish. It's actually the same fish that catch, you know, the A-rig catches too, quite honestly. It, 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 it's it's a fish that's pre-spawn that, that spends a lot of her time um, hovering, uh, suspended. You know, she's not always just on the bottom. And so even though it may be 25 foot deep, the fish is still shallow. Hey, this is not just a Grand Lake, Oklahoma thing either for your guys watching this. This is this is nationwide and this is yeah it just gets is, a lot of like televised right tournaments this is, on grand lake this is this is all this is all species of bass quite as well you know too i mean spotted bass do the same thing um you know the the lake lanier tournament the flw tour that i won on lanier those fish i caught off a dock same type of deal and i couldn't use a spinner bait because that water is so clear but it's the exact exact same thing except those fish were sitting over 180 foot of water out there on those, those breaks, you know, the wind breaks, the dock, but they were using that dock to sit up underneath to suspend and they're, they're pre-spawn, they're staging. They're going to go back behind that Marina to actually spawn and lay their eggs, but that's kind of a, a holding point. Right. And, and, and they're holding up on that and that's the same thing. So it's a suspended fish and you need watercolor to do it. And it doesn't have to be just chocolate milk because Grand Lake's not chocolate milk especially at the bottom end, it's got some water clarity, but water clarity in Oklahoma, you know, we're talking, you might be able to see three and a half foot, maybe four, maybe four, yeah. but that, that's about it. You can, you can see the glow of a spinnerbait blade, you know, a foot, foot and a half. You just see the glow, but, um, and that's, that's usually where it's, that's where it shines because what that thing does is it, it's pulling power is further than a jerk bait because the fish can number one, feel it. Um, that's a big thing too. So, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of, I feel like I'm jumping around, but no, it's good because what you just said is super eye opening to me, especially with like the big blades on a spinnerbait, right? Cause I think of throwing a half ounce spinnerbait with two, you know, Colorado or two willow leaf blades. Right. Uh -huh. And I, talking about how these fish are relating to the docks and you're pulling these fish and different water clarity, right. And using the linear as an example is awesome because right. it goes to talk to like, if you do get a, a lake that has a little bit of color in it 
instead of going to a single swim bait or instead of going to a jerk uh-huh. bait, you can go to a Colorado blade uh-huh. if you live in Michigan. So it kind of makes it way more national when you start to explain why it's working here. As yeah, it, it's, it's, it's the exact same thing. I mean, you know, the, the old saying that a bass is a bass is a bass is true here. And then that's basically what is happening. I mean, it is the same thing, but water clarity plays a big part um, as far as what you can get by with and what they want. Right. Cause once the water gets so clear, they just get too good of a look at it. Um, I will say this. Um, I don't know what it is about pre-spawn, but cold water bass, you know, think about it. We catch them on the red, we catch them on the bright sartreuse and white spinner baits, but we catch them a lot of times in places. So like the same places in Oklahoma that I'm catching those fish on this big gaudy giant spinner bait in March, early March, if I was to go in there and throw that same spinner bait in May, late May, dude, they ain't looking at that thing. Yeah. They're not, I've got to give them something much smaller, much more clear, much more translucent, much more fun. You know, something looks a lot more, a swim bait. You know what I mean? Yeah. I it's just a t- swim bait. They, it's, it's, all, it's almost like I've also wondered this when they get cold, is their eyesight not as good? Right. Yeah. Um, I do know this. So like this is, this is to the big spinner bait. Um, and you guys probably, a lot of y'all probably know this, but I mean, there's not a doubt in my mind about this. This is a fact. When that water's cold, so like early pre-spawn, you know, you were talking about the blades on the big spinner bait. And you're talking about a big Colorado. Yep. Um, I do throw that big Colorado and I throw that big single Colorado, you know, like a number four, number five, Hildebrandt and um, maybe a six. I mean, we get ridiculous with that thing. Sevens and eights. I mean, those things get huge, but it's the thump, right? The thump, thump, thump. So when you throw one of those single Colorado Hillebrands and you start winding it real slow, you know, you, your rod tips just bouncing. Dun, dun, dun. You, know, you with me? Yep. And those fish are feeding. Now we do it one because our water color, right? It's, it's dirtier. And two, it's, it's the w- water temperature. You know, I'm talking down in the fifties, low fifties, low, low fifties. Um, and it's that thump. That thump is the same thump that you feel with a chatterbait. You remember when that thing first came out? I was like, dude, that's just like a number four. You know? yeah. It's the same. Thump, 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 thump. It's the same thump. And those fish are using, I'm convinced of this, dude. When the water's cold like that, they fish off their lateral line. They feed. They fish. They feed off their lateral line more than they feed off by sight. And then the warmer it gets, the less important that lateral line becomes and the more their sight becomes a bigger deal. I love it, man, because Alex had a biologist on, I think, last week or two weeks ago. And one of the things Alex asked him was about, you know, why brighter colors seem to work better in the spring and why louder or heavier thumping baits, one knockers, big mm-hmm. spinner baits seem to work better. And they, they basically got in like a really scientific conversation talking about like the cones in their eyes not being as receptive <clears throat> in the early season. So it's really interesting to hear you say that. Yeah, I don't, I don't think they can see as well, and I and, and and I do think that they. I think that's why they. So, like, if you take a person, they just yeah. any human being that's born with below average eyesight, um, I bet if you test their hearing, I bet their hearing is probably better than the average person's hearing, right? Because they've adapted to make something stronger, and I, I guarantee you, dude, like if the water gets colder, they can't see as good, but they can feel better. And I think that's why the chatterbaits and, and these different things that have that thump, I think that's why they play in that, that early pre-spawn. And, you know, we throw these big gaudy colors. But, like, by the time that tournament was there in that FLW Tour event you're talking about, you know, um, here's a funny thing with that. And I don't know if you caught this or not, but you probably did because you had all my video and you were looking at it. But I threw that Sartreuse and White double willow leaf as well. I was throwing that spinner bait quite honestly, because – Everybody on that lake, the, the little red kicker blade that they make on spinnerbaits now and are sold nationwide, there was a time when me, Terry Butcher, Jason Christie, there was like maybe 15 or 20 of us in the state of Oklahoma that had that. Like it wasn't a known thing. It wasn't talked about, and we caught them on it. And um, that changed, right? Obviously, they're, they're pre-manufactured that way. And so I knew that all those guys in that tournament were throwing that spinnerbait. So I'm just looking for something different. Quite honestly, fishing is that stupid simple. Like that's Brian Thrift 101. Just what is everybody else throwing? Give me something different. And that spinner bait, that Sartreuse and White Double Willow is a blade that's real popular on uh, Lake Cumberland. And yeah. so I had them because we'd been to Cumberland the year before. 
And so I start throwing it and I start catching them on it really, really good. And, you know, and I make the top 20 and then I, I didn't make the top 10 the last day. But um, when that thing airs and I go to watch them, you realize, so lawyer in first place wins it. And the guy from Africa in second place that was in the back of Horse Creek, he's throwing the same damn spinnerbait. And, you know, I finished 11th, 12th, 13th, whatever it was. But we're all three throwing the exact same spinnerbait, dude. Well, and it's funny, man, because one of the best, like one of my best memories of the season was sitting in the garage the night before day three, and you were trying to change the blades out on your spinnerbaits. Yeah. And uh, I go, dude, why? Like, I think you pulled one of those orange blades. You had an orange big single Colorado off, and you had switched it up with a different blade. Mm -hmm. And uh, all you had said to me was, dude, it's just something that I don't think the other guys are throwing right now. Right. And, just wanted uh, something different. Yeah. Yeah, it's really cool. Yeah, the the spinnerbait bite's really good there. It's feast or famine, which you saw. You know, I mean, if I yeah. get one more bite on day three, I have no problem making day four. And I mean, if I get a couple of bites, I mean, I've got a shot to win that thing. And um, it just didn't happen for me that week. But uh, that's a that's a special bait, and it works all over the country. This is not just a Grand Lake deal like we do it all in the state of Oklahoma, Texas. I mean, you follow it does all there. But dude, I mean, like the TVA lakes, uh, Wheeler, Wilson. It'll play on those, same thing, um, all throughout the southeast, Watts Bar. Um, any of those lakes like that, it'll play. It's just you've got to get those fish at the right time of the year where they're they're moving up. Um, a lot of times, too, you know, with those docks, and this is the same with A-Rig and the Jerkbait. Now, this, this probably wouldn't be at Lanier because those were 180 foot deep out there. But the ones at Grand Lake – you know, you just see the side of a dock and you see a guy slow roll a cast and he's throwing a spinnerbait and he may have let it sink, you know, four or five. So that thing may be running six or seven foot. And then let's say that it's 20 foot deep underneath the end of that dock. But there may be a 12 foot brush pile. So it's only four foot from the top. So you're all, you're technically bumping it with your spinnerbait, you know, when you come across. And that that, that happens a lot too. You know, it's, it's stuff that guys don't see as much as they're going to see it more now because of... <laughs> Live scope, right. right? And that's what I was going to ask. I was going to say, like, how much of that are you seeing yeah. now, like, as you roll yeah. up to a dock, whether you're on perspective yeah. mode, I mean, or mm -hmm. you're on actual live forward, right? Right. How much of that are you looking for? Like, you're coming up to a dock and you're like, there it is. Like, because those guys put giant brush piles at the end of these docks. You're probably like me. Um, you know, I, I started with live scope. I was with Garmin when it came out, just like, just like you were. And, um, I, the more time goes by, the less time I spend looking at the water. Like, dude, my eyes are on that thing all the time. Yeah, it's constant. Like all the time. Constantly. Yeah. Yep. I like just I like yeah, so like, graph. That's all I, I really should just go back to one graph on the front because that's the only one I need. I don't I don't need another one. It's funny, man, because literally top half of my graph is it's a twelve and I basically run it. So there's like this much of the uh GPS. Oh, yeah. yeah. It just yep. the rest is just all yeah. Live scope. I don't run anything else. So GPS would be the only thing. Yeah, that's exactly right. Mm -hmm. But no, I, I think that's um, cool talking about like how you're starting to approach these docks. There's the picture that I used in the thumbnail where you're doing something a little bit totally different than what a lot of guys were doing to catch this fish. And it takes a lot more time, which is basically going and putting your boat as close to these, what is mm -hmm. it, like cross beam? In yeah, walk, walkways and stuff, just just different places where they're either walkways or they're beams to hold the docks, you know, to the bank. I mean, you're just trying to get to where everybody hasn't made a cast, you know. And um, yeah, I'll, I'll I'll I call it crawling. I'll go crawling. <laughs> That's what and I call it. Like the Oklahoma guys, and I think Upshaw's boat had it, but you had it by the end of the tournament. You all have marks on your trolling motor, and I know where your trolling motor is rubbing dars and everything else, but mm -hmm. or not trolling motor, your, your big motor. But I yeah. just think that's interesting. So where are you really keen with a big spinner bait? Is it, is it a dock bait typically for you? Is it like you go to pre-spawn areas and you're looking for them there or where are you typically looking for a big spinner bait bait? Man, you can find it in a lot of places. So the thing that I will tell you is the thing that is the same is it is a, it's a transition place, right? Well, I don't know if that's right. It's a staging place. They are all, that's what they are. Every single one of them is a staging spot. That's what I'm looking for. Now, that staging spot can change depending on 
what part of the lake you're in, what's set up and what, what the structure's like. The, the staging spot can be literally a bank. It can be a creek channel bend that comes up and bumps the bank and turns, you know, and it's got some nice rock and it's got a lead shelf drop off and the cold fronts come and they've all pulled back to that and that's it. You know, that's the staging spot. But that same staging spot after a couple of days of warm weather could be on up into the creek where it's more flat, you know, on the flat side of it. And they're all scattered out there and we catch them on spinnerbait. Um, the staging spot can be, when we're talking about docks, um, man, I have seen it so good before at Ufala, Texoma, um, where they were on the ladders, just where the, and the ladders are always on the front because people are swimming, you know, and then they want to be able to swim up. So they're jumping off the deep, deepest part of their docks. So they put the ladder on the front yeah. and, um, man, this thing just folds down. It just hangs down like four or five foot in the water you know and then a lot of them you can pull up people just leave them in you know because i mean it's not like our lakes are freezing over or anything and um man i mean i've seen it to where literally you pull into a cove it's got 25 docks in front of you and you can go fish everything on it just skip the ladder and you'll never get a bite or you can do nothing but fish the ladder <laughs> and you will catch a fish or multiple fish off every single ladder in there and um I showed this to a buddy of mine one time and before a BFL and it was so strong. He, he hadn't caught anything all week. And I was like, look, dude, he was like stressing. He'd been up there all week. And I was like, just, just last day of practice, just come with me. Just leave your boat here. We're only going to practice about a half a day. Yeah. We'll run down. I'll show you a pocket that I hadn't been in, but I bet you they're in. So, and so I'm telling him about this and I got this spinner bait, you know? And so I get in front of the dock and parallel the, the ladder, you know, and it comes the ladder, ding, you know, I said, hook. And I'm like, all right. Now you see those ladders down through there? And he's like, yeah. And I'm like, all right, get up here in the front and do it. So he gets up in the front, you know, and he counts it down. You know, I said, let it sink a little. You know, we do a little countdown to get it to the right depth. And he he catches one, he catches another. And then he goes to the third one. And he's like, I'm not catching one here. And I said, why not? And he said, because I can just count them. What I'm going to catch tomorrow, five, six, seven, <laughs> eight, nine, ten. He's like, I'm catching one off every one. I was like, all right, let's go to the house. And he's like, yeah. So it but, uh, it's, it's a good bait. But those are staging areas, right? So all those fish are doing is they're pulling up those, every one of those docks hung over the Creek channel. That was the secret to that one. And so okay. the, the channel didn't matter if it was 200 foot deep or five foot deep, you could be back in the back of a pocket, but it would be the dock that hung over the ditch. You know what I mean? And they're following yeah. that ditch. It's the highway. And so wherever that ladder was, it was hanging on a ditch. That's where every fish was. That's so cool. Um, and then kind of talk about how you've, you've kind of mentioned it, but like talk about, is it, What's your retrieve on it? Like, what do you, how are you typically, you know, casting it? Are you skipping it? Are you flipping up in there? Are you like, what are you doing to be effective with it? Flip a pitch, roll cast, whatever I can do to put it in places that I feel like one people hadn't all been cast into. Right. So I want to put it in tight places. Um, heaviest cover that I can find. Um, the retrieve is, you know, the earlier in the pre-spawn, the slower it is. That, that's what helps with the double willow or the double willow, the single willow, single yeah. willow, the single Colorado is it, it just, you know, it pulls so hard. And I mean, you can just barely turn the handle and it's just thump, thump, thump. And it moves real slow. Um, it's hard to move a double willow, you know, as slow as that. It, it wouldn't be that good that early in the spring, but you know, once you start getting up in the upper fifties, then things change and you could go to that well, willow Colorado yeah. tandem. Um, you know, if I lived up there where you guys live, I don't know. I just have to experiment with it. But I know that willows would play more than the Colorado would with the smallmouth. Yeah. But I also know that, you know, I mean, once the ice goes out, the water it warms up pretty quick. Those fish get pretty excited pretty fast. They just want speed. So I think I probably would just be throwing either a tandem or a double willow. And just, but man, golly, that's just such a strong bait, dude. And I know it is up there where you guys live too. I mean, hell, the greatest fit bass spinnerbait fisherman of all time. Um, yeah. even though he's put it down and doesn't throw it anymore, it's Kevin Van Dam and dude, he's from your house. So, you know, he's your neighborhood and I, I promise you, he didn't learn that on the road. He learned that at the house. So it's, it's one of those things too, where it's almost like a forgotten bait. Like you see it kind of play for some guys early in the spring when, you know, you got the big Colorado play and then you got like maybe a spinnerbait bite, but you don't see it on St. Clair. You don't see it on these places where you think it should be playing anymore because there's so many other baits now. But like you said, man, it, it does work. Like there's times and places where it is the, the bait to be thrown. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's a little bit loud. You know what I mean? It's a little bit too much 
for our educated fish, right? I mean, that's really what's happened to it. Yeah. It's it's just a little bit much, but there, there's those times when, um, you know, like they hadn't, you can get it in places they hadn't seen it or, you know, you're throwing it when everybody's just gone to the swim baits or the other things. And they just like, it's just, it's just become, like you said, guys aren't using it. Um, the one thing I will tell you, man, is that spinner bait will win you money and win tournaments too. Like it is, it catches the right ones, right? Like that's what was happening at Grand. I mean, hell, nobody at Grand was getting very many bites. Not even the guy, not even lawyer that won it. But man, when you got one on that spinner bait, dude, like yeah, it was four or right five pounds. I mean, they yeah. were big ones. They were the right ones. They were just huge. Yeah. Um, and then talk about. So, what are you typically targeting as far as like depth? Right. You said you're targeting. Um, so like I said, I don't, I don't let the, so that's what I, yeah, like the depth doesn't matter, you know, just like the ones at Lanier, even that wasn't a spinner bait, but that, those are the same fish, dude. Those fish were over 180, but they were suspended. You know, they were just sitting 10 foot under the dock. Well, the fish in Oklahoma sit five foot under the dock instead of 10, because they can't even see the damn thing 10 foot deep because it's too right. muddy. So they'll get five foot and sit underneath it five foot. So that's where I kind of want to count my spinner bait down to if I'm throwing a half ounce or three quarter, you know, just one, two, three, four. I just want it to go right above there. You know, if the fish is sitting here, I just want that spinner bait right here above him. So he's just got to kill it. Um, so a lot of that's water color, right? So um, what depth are they sitting at? How long do I let it sink before I start my retrieve? And then try to keep it at that depth has a lot to do with the blade combination. Um, and that's where I kind of change the weights is depending on my blade combination, right? Because Colorado's take more because Colorado's tend to lift more. Willows will help you stay down, you know? So yeah. you just kind of got to play that two ends to the middle, but it's, it's always a changing game. Just like you saw me, you know, talking about me being out there in the house and um, tying up my own spinner baits and making up my own stuff. That's, that's pretty common for me. I mean, I do that a lot. I wish I did it a lot more, you know, like when we were at Rayburn, when I first met you, yeah. I should have thrown everything I had away and just went and, you know, spinner bait and half ounce jig, and I'd have had a lot better tournament there. You know, instead I got yeah. a spinning rod in my hand, at a lake yeah. that's got nothing but giants in it. Looking back now, yeah, I mean, yeah, that's a different story. But I remember looking at that footage day one, and I was like, seeing what Dove was doing and Nick was doing and these Schmitty was doing, and I'm like, of all the guys with the spinning rod, like this is not the one. No, but, wrong. Um, no, so. It's, it's very much like a swim bait in that aspect. You kind of just have to get the feel for where these fish are, whether yeah. they're up and, and yeah. Absolutely. And Daniel Abrams. The, 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 swim, the swim bait honestly is the new spinner bait. That's yeah. honestly what it is. You know, it's a fish that's been pressured. They're smarter. They've seen a lot of baits and they're just not as easy to go hit that. It's just too much. You know, the, the metal and the flash and the arm and they just, they're too smart. And so the swim baits replace that. The, the swim bait is the new spinner bait. Yeah. And yeah, that's awesome. So there was a question that says, when do you choose the spinner bait over an A rig or chatter bait? Is there a certain time for you to uh, pick that up over the others? Did you say the A rig over the chatter bait? Uh, spinner bait versus A rig versus chatter bait. Like, how do you know? when you would pick one up over there. Well, I'd throw the A-Rig a lot if I was allowed to throw it. Uh, they don't let us throw it most places I fish. So if I could throw the A-Rig, I'd be throwing the A-Rig. Um, chatterbait over a spinnerbait. Are you a big chatterbait guy? Do you throw the chatterbait a lot? I like it. I've had some really good days on it. I probably should throw it more than I throw it. Um, I almost won a tournament at Louisville, a Bassmaster Open. Let it go in the last day. Had a huge lead. Didn't catch a damn bass the last day. Not a bass. It's the worst cold front of the year. And uh, the, the only thing on the line was a Bassmaster Classic at Grand Lake. You yeah, know, no big deal, right? No big deal. Uh, yeah, I lost by like two ounces or maybe an ounce. One ounce, two ounces. Didn't weigh a bass. It was like an ounce or two. Um, I caught one, 13, and seven eighths. Wasn't a 14 incher. Anyway. Um, I caught all those fish on chatterbait that week. Um, Florida, they like chatterbaits. So there's places. So I guess this is it. There are places and times when they are very much alike as far as how the moon aligns. Like, hey, I could throw a spinnerbait here and catch fish, and you could. Yeah. But the chatterbait, 
will catch a little bit more or a little bit bigger if you were throwing that. They both will play. They both will catch fish, but the chatterbait will outperform it. And that was happening, obviously, early when the chatterbait first came out. That was really a big deal. Fish hadn't seen it. Um, and it's still somewhat of a, especially in certain parts of the country, Grand Lake was a good example. So Brian Thrift made the top 10 that year, that week, right? Like he had a shot to win it. I think he finished second or third. He had a shot yeah. to win it. Um, I'll never forget. I was laying in bed day three, that, that third day of that tournament. I mean, we hadn't left, you know, cause we're staying right there by the ramp. My phone rings, it's Brian Thrift. He's like, Hey Bubba. Now you granted he caught 20, two or 23 pounds on day two to make the top 20 cut. You know, I'm just like 15 and 16 pounds, just kind of getting by. He has this mega bag to get in. He calls me and he's like, Hey Bubba, what are you doing? And I was like, I'm laying in bed. He's like, Oh, you're not here yet. And I'm like, no. And he goes, Oh, well, I was just calling to tell you they're uh, we're going to have a delay because of the weather. Um, I just want to know, can we go eat breakfast? He's like, is there a place open? I'll just meet you for breakfast. I'm like, yeah, there's a diner over there, but dude, I'm still in bed. I'll probably just stay here. And he's like, all right. He says, uh, what are we going to do to catch them biggins today, Hallman? Where, where, where can I find some of them biggins? And I'm like, <laughs> dude, I told him, I said, you're the one just smashed 20 something yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. But he was chatterbaiting. That's my point. And I didn't know that then, but he, he, he's, he's, dude, I promise you, he's throwing it in the exact same places that I'm throwing a spinner bait. He's just getting that one or two bites that I'm not getting because it's a fish that quite honestly probably hadn't seen it. it was smart, yeah. smart dude, smart yeah. guy. When, when I was tying up all them spinner baits and I'm talking about, well, I bet nobody been throwing this one. I should have been, I should have had a chatterbait laying right next to it. That's so funny, man. And, and thrift is just insanely smart. You, you've seen he it is. time and time again, but just like so insanely natural when he gets on the water. So he's really, really good, dude. He's a good thinker. Um, kind of building off that, what do you think makes, uh, we're kind of done with the spinnerbait thing. I appreciate you all sharing all that knowledge, but we're just going to take a couple questions here. And, uh, I have a question. What do you think makes that like elite level fisherman, right? Like what makes a guy go from a weekend angler to a really good fisherman from a good to like elite? Is it all in the, it, like upstairs? Um, no, it's, it's, it's multiple things. Um, so I've done this a long time, right? And I'm friends with the very best in the world. Like Jason Christie's a good friend of mine. Brian Thrift's a good friend of mine. I mean, I've got buddies that I run with, roommate with, I've known for a long time. Um, they are guys that now when I now this is different than like local being local, good at a local level. I'm talking about something different here. These these guys at the elite level, like the very best anglers in the world. I call them one percenters, right? Scott Martin's one of them. Uh, Jason Christie's one, Thrift's one. Um, they're kind of one percenters. It, it's a combination of four or five, six different things. Number one, they got the love for it, right? Which we've all got. So they love it. Like they can't get tired of it. They can never get tired of it. They love it as much as anybody. Um, you have to have that because if you don't, you can't put up with all the bad times. Um, they're extremely intelligent. I mean, I'm not talking about like a little bit smart. I'm talking about they're above average, like these. So half of them could be brain surgeon, like Brian Thrift, without a shadow of a doubt, could be a brain surgeon. Um, he's got a photographic memory. Um, you know, he he golly shucks an old country boy as good as there is, dude. But I'm telling you, um, he doesn't miss anything. Um, they're extremely intelligent, above average IQ. Um, but here's here here's here's the big thing I'm going to tell you, and this is this is with anything. So like. Uh, this is with any business. This is any sport. So Kobe Bryant, kind of the same way. Um, Michael Jordan, Larry Bird. There is nothing else in their life. Does that make sense? Like they don't have – their entire purpose is to become better at fishing every single day. So um, nothing else exists. Nothing. And I, I, I mean hardly anything. Like the world becomes their encyclopedia oyster because all they're looking for is fishing. All they do is talk fishing. All they do is fishing. Um, they constantly do nothing but fish to a point where, like my, me myself, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm no Kevin Van Dam or, or Jason Christie. I'm not comparing myself to those guys, but but I'm a I, I'm an all right fisherman, you know. I mean, I've been doing this a long time. I feel like I know what I'm doing. Um, 
I get tired of it, dude. Like I, I want to go get absorbed into college football. I want to go get absorbed into, you know, my wife and kid. And I'm not saying that thrift and them don't do that, but like, I, they, they, yeah, they, they, they're not going to the damn movies or anything like that. You know, like uh, Kobe Bryant was talking about vacations uh, that he saw other basketball players taking with each other. It almost made him sick. He's like, why the hell would they do that? I mean, they want to do nothing but focus on what is going to make them better on their craft. If, if it, if, if 30 minutes of doing something doesn't give them an advantage or make them better at what they're doing, they're not interested. They really aren't. They're really not interested. It's, it's, it's amazing. Like when you say it, like compare it to other things, fishing is so small, man, fishing is so right. tiny, but when you compare it to Kobe Bryant and compare it to the best of the best, you right. really start to see it because you get a little bit better look into Kobe Bryant's life or whoever else's life as opposed to Ryan Thrift's. Right. So, yeah, they, they, they really, they really, that's, that's what they do. And, and, and they are so mono focused and they're able to keep that mono focus. Right. Because I mean, a guy like myself, I'm pretty mono focused too. And I can get on bass fishing and I can, I mean, that's why we're sitting here having this conversation tonight on Sunday night. Dude, I love doing this and I love talking about fishing. Yeah. But those guys never, ever, ever quit. Like ever, like I'm going to get out of here and I've got to go get some horses and hook up a horse trailer and do some stuff for the girls. And I mean, I, I'm not saying Jason and them stuff don't do that with and Brian too with his kids. They do, but um, my mind gets other places, and I don't think there's ever does. I, I honestly think they can stay focused for 25 years and just burn candles at both ends. Yeah, that's insane, dude. So there are a couple questions coming in over the comments talking about the rod, the reel, and um, some of the baits that you like to throw. So mm -hmm. you run falcon rods. Yep. What rod do you throw your spinner bait on? What rod do you throw your chatter bait on? And then typically what line, like if you had to choose, you know, a line or a range of lines, and what reel are you throwing it on? Reel, I'm still throwing the Chinese, or I buy some Shimano's or. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. I, even the new Shimano's I bought, man, they're not what they used to be. Like I can't go fish with them for five years. Like I used to, uh, they're not, they're not the same reel. Um, yeah. the Chinese reels, I buy a lot of those cause they're 20, $25. And then if they crap out. I mean, my fishing line costs more than they do. I just throw them in the trash when you change line. Yeah. I like the Chinese reels. I do. Um, the, uh, the rods, the rods are important because that has a lot to do with the action of your bait hook sets and landing fish. Um, with the Falcons, a 7.3 and an Amistad and a 7.4 Amistad, extra heavy, which is made an expert. And those depend on what I'm throwing. If I'm throwing my braid on uh, my braid, if I'm throwing my spinner bait on braid, which is a lot, um, and that's not usual around the country, but um, it is for where I live because, like I say, the watercolors, they can't see it, and I land every fish. So, But yeah. if I'm throwing it on braid, I throw it on the 7.3. Uh, Amistad. If I'm throwing it on fluorocarbon, then I'm probably throwing it on the extra heavy because it's just a little bit stiffer. It's one step up. Yeah. Um, just to get a better hook set. Um, I always run a trailer hook. Guys ask me about that all the time. I've always got a trailer hook on. Um, in a tournament, that is, you know, not just fun fishing, but tournament fishing, I do. I wouldn't run one just fun fishing if you guys are still fun fishing, especially if they're eating the bait good because, man, you do get some fish deep sometimes with that thing and you know, I guess early in the year, you know, you, they usually live, but you, you do run the risk of hurting a fish. So there's really no use to run a trailer hook unless you are a fishing tournament. But um, rod, real line. Um, so when I say braid, I generally throw that on a sunline braid. I usually throw 50 pound. That FX2 is pretty good stuff. Yeah. Um, I like it. Um, with the fluorocarbon, um, I usually throw the uh, sniper. Yes, I get sniper and shooter sometimes with my head mixed up. Shooter I use for flipping, pitching. Anything I'm winding, that, that's that's how I tell everybody. They're like, what's the difference? Anything I'm winding, I throw a sniper. It casts a little better. It's just I like it. I like anything winding. But anything I'm dragging and would have like a slack hook set in, that's what I shoot shooter for. But So anywhere from 20 to 15-pound test. Uh, 15, you know, like I say, we're talking about the – the depths at which I want it to sustain, right? If I'm letting it sink. Um, and then my blade combination and my head combination, your line comes into that equation as well. Sometimes I can stay with a half ounce and not have to go to a three quarter. If I'll just go down to 15 pound test line. I did that at a 
Cumberland Lake. They eat that spinnerbait there really well. Yeah. And uh, it's got some watercolor to it too. And those are smallmouth. Yeah, Cumberland they, is a cool lake. Cumberland mm -hmm. is really they, interesting. It's got that green color to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They eat it really good there. Do you fish a trailer on your spinnerbait at all? Yeah. Um, more so the colder it is, the less so the warmer it gets. So remember what we were talking about, the cold weather they see but don't see as well. Yeah. And I think you get the thump. I think we're back to that lateral line deal. So you get both of the thump, you know, that big blade, and then you get the thump mm -hmm. from the, the, the trailer on that. Yeah, I mean, Jason, I mean, he had it on the Classic, but he actually was throwing, you know, the boot tail type yeah. swim bait on the back of it. Dude, that's about the thump. Yeah. Yep. So that's interesting. And going back to that, too, um, start to talk about, like, your blade combination. As it's colder, you said you're throwing, like, a Colorado blade, and as the water starts to warm up, mm -hmm. you tend to switch to willow leaves. And then mm -hmm. you start going smaller with blades, or is it just pretty much like once you have double willow, it's pretty much a standard half ounce spinnerbait? Or no, I mean I like to stay with big side blades, right? The only time I get smaller in blades is sometimes in the fall. Fall tends to be a smaller spinnerbait profile and blade for me. I've had a lot of success with that, um, dude. I like that uh, that Indiana blade a lot in the fall, and that's not a blade that you see. Uh, you don't just go to the store and buy spinnerbaits with an Indiana on it. Right. Um, they're, they're hard to find or you have to make your own. Well, that's what you're putting on that one day, right? Like that's what, that moved the blades were switching a couple of your spinnerbaits out to. So that was so the Indianas. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. believe that. Cause I, I do. I, I really enjoy that blade. I've caught a lot of fish on it. Um, like I say, it's a blade that primarily in the fall is where I really have, have wing ding them on it. And it'd be a smaller, smaller profile, you know, smaller blades. Oh Yeah. So one of the questions that just came in, and it's Carl Acorn. I'm not sure if you've ever seen that name on your channel, but he's been asking, um, which, what do you think of the Falcon Cara rod? Cara, C-A-R-A. Cara, you were out the first time. What do you think of that rod? Have you fished it much? I haven't got thrown much. I don't have mine. Um, everybody else has got theirs, and I do not have mine. I don't have them. I don't have a single one of them. Um, I don't know. I guess I didn't put my order in. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't have, uh, I guess they're going to leave me. I probably, probably what it is, they're going to leave me on the low budget live. Uh, uh, so I'm staying with the low riders and uh, the, uh, the experts, but the experts yeah. are not low budget, but the low riders. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, dude, the carriers are the deal. They were the deal. Um, they've been gone for a while. Everybody's been asking for them. They sold out of them. Like literally they don't hardly have, they don't have any left. That's why I don't have them. They don't right. have any left. Um, I didn't get them, so I don't know. Uh, Y'all have to ask Jason Christie or one of them boys about them because I don't have them. Yeah, and then the Magnum Speed Vibe. Um, someone said, is that your favorite worm? No, I wouldn't say it's my favorite worm by no means. Um, I do like the Mag Speed Worm. Um, I like it. There's, there's three or four companies out that have got that worm out now, and um, I use all of them for different 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 situations. The Mag was just the, the first, the Speed Worm was. Um it's it was it was a bad mammer jammer. Big bot's got big bot's got a new one out called the tour worm. It's got that same tail action. It's got some ribs on it. Um, Pradco's or Yum has a bait worm out that's pretty good too. So there's three or four of those worms out there that are pretty effective. And then which spinner baits do you use? Like do you just buy bodies and you build your own, or, or do you buy them off the shelf? Or? Say that again. I'm sorry. Which spinner baits do you use? Do you buy like? just the bodies and build them or do you buy them off the shelf? I buy a lot of them off the shelf. And then, um, you know, I, I'm not afraid to change one that, 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 uh, that I've got right there. Cause I carry a box of blades in my boat. Benjamin see me do it. Like yeah. I, I, I'll do that instead of sitting down and retying and going through a box of new blades. Like if I just want to make a small adjustment, um, especially if it's the end blade, that's real easy to change. I'll just, I'll just change the blade out real quick instead of changing all of my old spinner bait and retying. Yeah. And then uh, let's start talking Super Bowl. All right. We watch some football. Who do you want to win the Super Bowl? Well, you have to tell me who's in there because I watched it all the way up until last week. And when last week happened, the Browns were out. There was no more. I know. Um, is Tom Brady, I guess, is in. So, yep, and Tom Kansas, Brady in the Kansas box. City Chiefs. Yep. Yeah. I kind of want I, I want to see Brady win solely for the fact of just like – for a guy to go somewhere, and granted, he had a bunch of people following there, but I'm for that you. to happen, I'm with you. I, I think insane. 
man, there's just nothing at the Chiefs. Like, there's a lot of Chief fans live around here. Uh, where I live, they're either Chiefs fans, you know, because it's just north, or they're Cowboy yeah. fans south. But uh, I don't, I don't care for either one of them. Um, I'm with you, dude. Like, I'm with Brady just to see him go win somewhere else after all those Super Bowls. Because, like, if he wins the Super Bowl this year, man, I don't care what y'all talking about. He's the greatest quarterback of all time. Like, yeah, there, there hang, so much hang it up. Like, it's over. It's there's so much talk. Is it Belichick? Is it Brady? Like, what is the secret sauce in this? Like, it group, is right. And dude, it, if he wins, it's over. It's over. Is he? He's the greatest quarterback of all time. Period. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't you can't even have a conversation anymore. Like, no. It's already hard to have one. But no. Oh, but the Chiefs are going to be hell to be, dude. Those yeah. boys are so bad good. to the bone. Bad to the bone. They're so good. Uh, White Whale says. What color spinnerbaits do you fish? Do you fish any spinnerbait colors other than white and chartreuse? Yeah, I've got some uh, silver. You know, um, they got one called Mouse. We got one that was called. Uh, when I'm saying these colors, these were all War Eagle colors because the War Eagle was a spinnerbait that I threw forever. Um, spot remover, Mouse. Mouse was kind of a translucent clear with a little bit of black speck in it. So yeah, I mean, there's definitely there's definitely some colors. Like I say, we we. We get to a point at a certain time of year where you almost try to start trying to hide your spinner bait from the fish. Like you're literally trying to make it not look so flashy. Yeah. In your yeah. face. You know? Yeah. Well, cool, man. I know you got a couple things to do and uh, I really appreciate your time, but Oh, there's one more, one more question. Do you adjust the arm on your spinner bait at all? Like do you adjust the angle of the arm? Yeah, it, it gets moved around a lot. You know, it gets stretched, too, with catching fish. Um, the more that you flex it up, the slower and the more lift you'll get. The more you pinch it down and make it more closed, the faster you can bring it, like if you're burning it, um, the better, you, the deeper you can fish it. So there's there's three or four things there that that'll change. But, yeah, I definitely, I definitely mess with that. I always want it in line, though. I've never been a guy that likes them out of line. Like, I don't like them kicked, you know. It's where I feel like it makes it. I want mine. Perfectly straight. Yeah. It's a pretty big yeah. deal to me. I like it. I like it. Because I just feel like it runs true. You know what I mean? Right. And the question comes from my buddy. And what he's – so, one of the things that he does, he creates, like, a Z-bend or, like, a where it comes up and then bends and then comes back up again. Yeah. Yeah. And so, do you do anything like that or is it pretty much just a straight – Straight. straight yep. Straight. Cool. cool. Well, man, thank you. Like yeah. I said, all righty, man, I appreciate you hopping on here. If you guys haven't already checked out Brad's stuff, actually give us a quick rundown. You you told me a little bit, if you can share anything about what you're doing this week with Upshaw <laughs> and those guys. Yeah. So tomorrow morning, Upshaw is supposed to be at my house. He's coming from Tulsa and he and I are going to get, I think I'm hoping he's got a brand new truck according to his YouTube. I haven't seen it yet. I'm hoping he's going to drive because we're taking my boat because his new boat's not in yet. And we are going to South Texas where it is, dog, guys, don't get mad. It's going to be between 80 to 90 degrees for highs every day. Insane, and uh, we're going to go down there and film. We're, we're, we're doing a, I guess a YouTube week is almost what you'd call it. We're just trying to get, you know, a bunch of videos and stuff in the can before the tournament season starts. We've got something for people watching our channel so that, you know, they don't dry up and wither away while we're fishing tournaments. Yeah. And you have a lot, like you're fishing a lot of events this year, right? Between the yeah. opens and, and we've got a lot of, we've got a lot of fish a week, off a week, fish a week, off a week. And then if I, if I try to cram some, Toyotas or Costas, whatever they're called. If I try to cram a couple of those in the middle, then it's just back to back to back to back. So yeah. um, we've got a couple here in Oklahoma, and I try to defend the border. That's usually what I try to do. Like if they come inside the border, I go defend the border like hell. So one more thing that that Rayburn event. Give us a rundown. We were talking a little bit prior to people getting on, but God. that tournament wasn't really like that. Lake wasn't fishing that great. No. Right. Right. So what's happening there is some of my buddies are not happy about it because it, it makes it look like it's great. So everybody wants to come because you see yeah. these 40 pound bags, right? Like what happened. But if you really look down the list, you know, 16th, 17th place, they only, they, there's 200 boats on this thing. They only caught yeah. like 15 pounds a day. It wasn't that good. It's just, there's a couple of needles in a haystack out there. And if you're one of the guys that finds them, which Jason Bonds was one of them, and he's one of us going YouTube, and, you know, he finished second in the event. So um, if Bonds Bonds had 34, 35 pounds on day two. Mega day. Mega yeah. day. 
but not as mega as the 39 not as mega almost 40. As Bundy and where he catches yeah. 40 pounds, you know what I mean? So, you know, I mean, 13 pounder will do that for you, right? Exactly. God, exactly. I wouldn't even, dude, I would fall over <laughs> and die if I caught a 13 pounder in a tournament. What's the biggest you've ever caught in ever. a tournament? Just ever, no. I don't know. I'm not probably not weighed them. I'm guilty. I'm just like Brian Thrift. I mean, I'm like, <laughs> I haven't put a 10 pounder on the scale. So, I mean, if you hadn't put it on the scale, you hadn't caught one, but I've caught some that I, you know. So you've uh, caught one that's, you've caught a double digit, but what about in a tournament? Have you caught like a nine? Well, that's what I'm thinking. Like one of the biggest bass I can ever remember, dude, was in an elite series event. And um, I found her sight fishing in practice the day before the tournament. And I could have swore, man, this thing, I knew it was 10. It's 10. It's the biggest fish I ever seen on bed in my life. Dude, she would attack the trolling motor. The male that was weather weighed four, four and a half. They, 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 would, they would attack the trolling motor. That's how aggressive they were. What lake? Uh, Santee Cooper, 2006. This is the one when Preston Clark won. So I run down there. It's in the bottom lake. I got to run through all these trees and channels and canals. And I draw this local. And he's like, hey, man, I know you're a rookie. Do you know where you're going? I go, yeah, I know where I'm going. He goes, you know about how dangerous this place is? And I'm like, yeah, there's a bunch of trees and stuff out here. And he's like, yeah. I said, look, man, you can't tell me anything as far as where to go or anything like that. But you can. You can tell me, hey, you're going to kill us. <laughs> Yeah. So I just took off running. Like I had no idea. I just knew that I had to get to that 10 pound bass. So I'm running 80 mile an hour. And this guy next to me, he's bumping me going, you really didn't know, do you? And I'm like, no. And he's like, get over. You're going to kill us. And so like, he gets us over to the left and I just, oh, you know, and he's bumping me. Hey, that way. And I go that way. But hell, I got a trail after that, you know? So we get down there. I drop trolling motor and dude, first flip, four pounder. I'm like, yeah. I'm like, that ain't her. <laughs> I went back in there. Don't. And she comes up and he's like, oh my God. And I'm like, yeah, that's her. Yeah. So I had 32 or 33. It's the biggest bag I ever caught in my life that day. It's 30, 30, 32, 32 something. Almost 33, I think. But anyway, um, I didn't weigh, I didn't weigh big bass because like I was, first of all, I was a little bit upset. So I hit the bank and you know, it's the way in, right? You hit the yeah. bank. Dude, I just left an eight pound. I got an eight pounder like down on my stuff, sucks it up and swims off and I'm shaking her off because I'm going to kick that four and a half pound. It's almost five. I'm going to kick it out. It's like going to be like a three pound upgrade. Yeah. I'm like, I'm catching that fish tomorrow. I'm shaking it off. I so I don't catch it anyway. I get to weigh in. I pull up on the bank. <clears throat> Terry Butcher, I'll never forget, you know, Edwin Evers' brother-in-law. He's from Oklahoma. Old Terry. He says, uh, did you have a good day, day home? And I said, yeah, man, I did. He goes, ha, what's a good day? I said, oh, no. I said, I got over 30. He goes, you had a good day. <laughs> and uh, I was like, damn, did they catch them that good? And he's like, he pointed down there. He said, uh, see Preston? I said, yeah. He said, he needs two bags. And I said, two bags? He said, yeah, to get all his fish in them. He had cameras everywhere, you know, ESPN. Just at, Preston had what, 42, 43 pounds? Yeah. Just stupid. So it I wish I'd have caught the eight, not shook it off, but I still caught the biggest bag of my life. And here's the problem. That fish was a double digit, but I was just, it was so big and everybody was a freak show. And so I wasn't like, well, <laughs> let me weigh my big bass, you know? So I just, I just put 30 pounds on and took it and went to the house, you know? Dude, I cannot, like, I can't even fathom the feeling to catch that big one. Like last year, what was it? First tournament of the year, you caught that eight and a quarter down in Florida. Yep. It's just, dude, I, I can't fathom, right? Like, I had the chance to go fish with Mikey down in Florida, and I caught a giant fish. Dude, you caught a giant, like a yeah. tent something. You caught one bigger than that when we were at a. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Chickamauga. Off the bay. Yeah. Off the bay. How big but, like, was that? It was a 9.5. But I yeah. still, I, I can't imagine this feeling of catching that fish in the tournament. Like, I don't, I don't know how you'd be able to compose yourself the rest of the day. Well. You, you you get back to it, but hey, it leaves warm fuzzies all day long when she's back there swimming in a live well. But um, you 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 get you get back to it. You just start. You know, we're fishermen. We're greedy. You're like hell. I want four more, just like her. Exactly. <laughs> that's exactly. how De that's how Dean Rojas's forty five pounds went down. Like everybody wants to break that. You know, I know yeah. I do. Like just give me the chance. But um, 
Yeah, dude. I don't know. I mean, yeah, I'll, I'll never forget coming in Chickamauga. You caught a fish bigger than anything I'd seen there the entire week, and you caught it right there where we were taking off at every day. Dude, that was so funny. So the story behind that, my buddy lives on Chick. Right? He's catching big ones right now on live bait, but he's like, man, just just take this swim bait with you and take it down to the ramp. He's like, just fish by this culvert. He so told you. He knew it, huh? He's like, there's always big ones that live there. There's always big ones. I'm like, I don't know, man. Like, I got a lot of work I got to get done, so I might take the rod, but I might not. Well, like, out the door, he's like, dude, you better take this fishing rod and throw this bait down there for, like, just throw it for an hour. So I get down there, and I'm throwing it off this bank, and there's this little point that comes out in this little stick up, right? So I cast this uh, S waiver right past the stick up, and I glide it. And I just see this fish roll on it, like flash on it. So I set the hook and I, I get it to the bank. I, at first, I don't know how I'm going to get this fish out. There was like a small area where I could get in or almost in the water. And yeah. I slide this fish out. Well, I'm trying not to big eye this thing. I know I have no, no way to weigh this fish. So I have the camera on. I like pull this fish out in shock. I'm like, man, this is like a seven pounder, seven pounder. There's guys across the way, like screaming at me. Holy smokes, dude. That's a giant. That's a giant. I'm like, yeah, get it. it is, there way, is there a way to get a scale on this thing? So end up, they drive a golf cart around to me. I have my camera on looping mode, five minute looping mode. Oh when God. I, when I get over to the weight tank, we put her in the, in the, tanks to keep her you know swimming around till we get a hold of bill to see if we can weigh her on the stage because there was no other scale dayton boat dock does not have a scale unless you get up on the stage so we weigh this fish and after i weigh this fish immediately i go dude i just lost all my footage like i don't have any of the fish catch don't have anything except for being in this tank so <laughs> lost lost actual fish catch but man it was insane like a nine five Crazy, sucks. crazy. That sucks so bad. It's I'm still footage. and amazing. So I well, remember I, you. I remember you telling me that when I got in. You're like, dude, I don't have <laughs> footage. I'm like, yeah. But I understand. I do. I totally understand. That's where looping will get you. And but you got to loop because if you don't, it's just editing forever. I, I totally get it. But, hey man, but, where is Alex? I thought he was going to join us. I don't know. I text him. Never text me back. The beard. Where is the, the beard? beard, dude? What we're gonna have happen? When you get back from this trip down south, one of the Friday Night Lives, you're going to have to come on to his, and we're just going to hang out and have a good time. Yeah, I would love to come on with him. I'm looking to see if he's in my phone. I was going to call him right here and just, like, rock the whole show. <laughs> I'm going to text you his number real quick. I've got it. Oh, you do? Give him a yeah. call. 865. Let me make sure. I don't know if he's got my number or not. Can you all hear that? Oh, yeah. There we go. Is it rude or red? Red. He's like a NASCAR driver. Should have known it was red. He ain't answering. Your call has been forwarded to an automated voice messaging system. Eight, six, five, nine. Oh, we can't do that. Oh, we can't do that. Oh, 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 sorry. <laughs> I realized. I just realized what was happening. I was like, whoa, 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 stop. I was going to go, hey, dude, you're live, but you're kind of not live because your recorder's not live, but you uh, were live. That's that was before it started reading out numbers. Well, you, we saved it, so we're good. But Yeah, we're good. That's that's amazing. But anyways, man, I'm going to hop off here. Um, I know you got a couple things you got to get done. I really appreciate it. And we're yeah, going to meet you on one of those Friday Night Lives with Alex. We'll dude, I'd love to. But you. thank you so much, dude. For right. real. Well, thank have you, fun. dude, for everything, man. I've learned a lot from you and uh, your YouTube and all that is wonderful. And like you were such a huge influence on us starting two years ago. And and to think that I couldn't even turn on a camera and how far, you know, that it's that crazy, dude. You this uh, sorry, I gotta tell this one more story. When I pull up to Rayburn, these guys, and this is not a knock on pro fishermen, it's just They'd never done it, right? They'd never yeah. run cameras. And the new rule on FLW is you had to have cameras. You got to have them running all day. You have to have them plugged uh -huh. into a power source. These guys hadn't run a camera before. So it's the day before the first tournament of the year. So we're trying to knock all the ru this rust off. And, uh, man, I'm teaching them how to run cameras. You've come so far. If you guys haven't checked out Brad's channel, I'm going to keep saying it. Brad yeah, has come, a come insanely good channel. And, uh, well, you do yeah. too, dude. You got an awesome one and uh, really appreciate it. 
Everything you've done for me, bud. Thank you. We'll have you on Friday Night Live, and uh, it's going to be fun. I'm looking forward to it. See you, buddy. All right, see you.